Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Tumors of the Esophagus Part 1. In this lecture, we will learn about the various tumors of the esophagus and we will talk about the common tumors of the esophagus and particularly we will talk about adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and its epidemiology, pathogenesis, morphology, clinical features, lab diagnosis and treatment. Then in the second part of this series, we will continue our discussion and talk about squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus and we will also talk briefly about the TNM staging of esophageal cancer. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. Now the first thing that the examiner may ask you from this topic is what are the tumors of the esophagus? Recall from my lecture on neoplasia we know that tumors can be either benign or malignant in nature. So similarly tumors of the esophagus can be either benign tumors or they can be malignant tumors, right? So first we can classify tumors of the esophagus under two broad headings. Some are benign in nature and some are malignant in nature. Now, one thing we have to remember, the examiner may ask you, which one is more common in esophagus? Is it benign tumors or is it malignant tumor? Which one happens more commonly? And the answer should be malignant tumor. Benign tumors of the esophagus are rare. So the examiner may ask you what are the benign tumors of the esophagus and then your answer will be we can classify them under two broad headings. One is epithelial origin and the other group is of mesenchymal origin. We can see that epithelial benign tumors of the esophagus are mainly of two types. One is known as squamous cell papilloma and the other type is known as adenoma. Now what do we mean by these terms? Squamous cell papilloma adenoma. In order to understand these terms, first we have to know the histology, the normal histology of the esophagus. So let's pause our discussion here and briefly have a look at the normal histology of the esophagus. So as you can see here I have drawn a simple diagrammatic image showing the normal histology of the esophagus. So what do we need to know from this image? Always remember esophagus has four layers. They are from inward to outwards, the mucosa, then there is submucosa, muscle layer, and the outermost layer of the esophagus is called adventitia. Also remember the mucosa is composed of three components. They are the epithelial cells, then there is lamina propria that is made up of loose connective tissue and also that is rich in cells like fibroblast, lymphocytes, mast cells, plasma cells, macrophages, etc. And also there is smooth muscle in the mucosa. Okay, so these things are making the mucosa. Three components, epithelial cells, lamina propria and smooth muscles. And often these smooth muscles of the mucosa are referred as muscularis mucosa. Okay, and one thing you have to remember regarding the epithelium of mucosa in esophagus, it is lined by non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So, what do we mean by this term non keratinized? It is obvious it is not producing keratin. Recall that the lining epithelium of skin was keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and those cells did produce keratin to make our skin tough. Now coming back to the esophagus, we are saying that the epithelium is non-keratinized and stratified. What do we mean by this term stratified? It means multiple layers. As we can see in this image, from this cell to this cell, we can see multiple layers of epithelial cells. So that's why we are saying that it is stratified and squamous epithelium. What do we mean by this term squamous? It means flattened epithelial cells. So non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium is making the mucosa of the esophagus. And then we have lamina propria and some smooth muscle. And that is all about the mucosa. 
And to finish the discussion about histology, we can see that I have also drawn submucosa and it is composed of submucosal glands. They produce mucous material that is then transferred to the luminal site and there it helps in lubrication of the food. The layer beneath the submucosa is the muscle layer and this is the actual muscle layer so it is often referred as muscularis propria. Don't confuse this muscle layer with, with the muscles that we had seen in the mucosa. The smooth muscle cells that are making a thin layer of muscle in the mucosa, they were referred as muscularis mucosa. And the main muscle layer of the esophagus that is beneath the submucosa is known as muscularis propria. Now, one interesting thing about this muscle layer is it is not the same throughout the esophagus. In the upper one third, in the middle one third and in the lower one third of the esophagus, the composition of muscle layer is different. For example, in the upper one third of the esophagus, the muscle layer of the esophagus is made up of entirely striated muscle. Okay. Then in the middle one third, the muscle layer has mixture of both striated and smooth muscle and in the lower one third of the esophagus, the muscle layer is composed of entirely smooth muscles. And recall that striated, muscle, striated muscles are under voluntary control. So as we can see in the esophagus, in the upper one third, there was voluntary control. And then as we are progressing, there is smooth muscles and those are under involuntary control. And this is very important for your multiple choice questions. There may be a stem like this part of the esophagus is composed of this type of muscle. And the outermost layer is adventitia. Why are we not writing serosa? Because the most part of the esophagus is not covered by peritoneum. Only a small fraction of the esophagus is covered by peritoneum. So that's why the outermost layer, we are not writing serosa, we are writing adventitia. So now that we have talked about the normal histology. Now we can see that we have non-creatinized stratified square mass epithelium in the esophagus. So therefore, if there is a benign tumor that is arising from these epithelial cells, we will name it square mass cell papilloma. We can also see that in the esophagus, there are glands. We have seen that in the submucosa, we have glands. So if there is a benign tumor that is arising from these glandular structures, we will refer to that as adenoma. So coming back to the classification of benign tumors of the esophagus, now we know what do we mean by squamous cell papilloma and what do we mean by adenoma. Now regarding adenoma, the examiner may ask you define adenoma and recall from my neoplasia lecture, we had seen that adenoma definition has two criteria. One is benign tumor of glandular origin which may or may not show glandular structure now is called adenoma. So here any benign tumor that was originated from a gland is defined as adenoma and it may or may not show glandular structure now. The second criteria of defining adenoma was benign tumor of any epithelial origin that is now showing glandular architecture. So all these two criteria can be used to define adenoma. And now we know that in the esophagus we have glands particularly in the submucosa and if a benign tumor is arising from those glandular structures we will refer to that as adenoma. Regarding the benign tumors of mesenchymal origin as you can see, I have written a lot of names and the examiner will mainly ask you about their names. So they will include leomyoma, lipoma, fibroma, neurofibroma, rhabdomyoma, lymphangioma, hemangioma, etc. What do we mean by leomyoma? So always remember leo stands for smooth and myo means muscle and the oma suffix as we know stands for benign tumor. So leomyoma means benign tumor of smooth muscle. What do we mean by lipoma? This is benign tumor of adipose tissue or fat cells. 
fibroma this is benign tumor of fibrous tissue origin neurofibroma it has both neural and fibrous components and it is also a benign tumor rhabdomyoma is benign tumor of striated muscle lymphangioma is benign tumor of lymphatic vessels hemangioma is benign tumor of blood vessels obviously esophagus has a lot of blood supply so it has blood vessels and if there is a benign tumor in those blood vessels that is referred to as hemangioma now one thing the examiner may ask you although benign tumor is rare but among these rare benign tumors which one is more usually seen or which one is common and the answer will be leomyoma so leomyoma is the most common benign tumor that occurs in the esophagus and like i said previously when we are comparing malignant tumors and benign tumors of the esophagus always remember that malignant tumors of the esophagus are more common benign tumors are rare so now let's talk about the malignant tumors so what are the malignant tumors of the esophagus as you can see i have written them under two broad headings most common and less common most common malignant tumors of the esophagus will include squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma now the examiner may ask you which one is more common is it squamous cell carcinoma or is it adenocarcinoma and the answer will be globally squamous cell carcinoma is more common however in western countries for example in the united states adenocarcinoma is on the rise Regarding less common malignant tumors of the esophagus, they will include unusual forms of adenocarcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma, melanoma, lymphoma, sarcoma, etc. Now, what do we mean by this term, undifferentiated? It means lack of differentiation. Here, the tumor cells morphologically will have a primitive or immature appearance and they will have almost no similarity with the structure of normal tissue from which the tumor arose so always remember undifferentiated means lack of differentiation here the tumor cells will have a primitive or immature morphology regarding neuroendocrine carcinoma these are carcinoma where the tumor cells are arising from specialized cells known as neuroendocrine cells what is melanoma it is malignant tumor of melanocytes what is lymphoma it is malignant tumor that is arising in lymphoid tissue and what is sarcoma it is malignant tumor of connective tissue now note melanoma lymphoma sarcoma these tumors have the oma suffix at their end and normally whenever we see oma suffix at the end of a tumor we think that that tumor should be benign however these are the exceptions melanoma lymphoma sarcoma these are not benign tumors these are malignant tumors so always keep this thing in your mind that oma suffix although it usually indicates benign tumor however there are exceptions to this rule so now that we have talked about the names of the various tumors of the esophagus let's move on and discuss the common tumors so now we will mainly talk about squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma in details let's start with adenocarcinoma of the esophagus as you can see it is more common in elderly white males sevenfold more common in males however some cases do occur in children as well what are the risk factors they will include obesity related gastroesophageal reflux disease barrett esophagus tobacco and radiation exposure now what do we mean by this term gastroesophageal reflux disease in order to explain this you can see that i have drawn a simple diagram of esophagus and stomach in the left side of the screen so normally when a food particle enters the stomach from the esophagus the lower esophageal sphincter becomes closed 
and the lower esophageal sphincter becomes closed to prevent backflow or reflux of acidic gastric content from the stomach to the esophagus. So that is the normal phenomenon. However, in certain individuals, either due to obesity or due to ingestion of certain food or drink, the lower esophageal sphincter fails to close completely. As a result, the acidic content of the stomach can reflux or it can backflow into the esophagus and that is not good for the esophagus. The lining epithelium of the esophagus was not designed to withstand such acidic content. So the esophagus tries to adapt. There is metaplasia and replacement of the normal mucosa with intestinal type columnar epithelial cells and this is known as Barrett esophagus but this is also a risk factor and it is a fertile soil for malignancy. Whenever there is such metaplasia or Barrett esophagus, there is increased risk of development of adenocarcinoma in the future. So that's why gastroesophageal reflux disease and Barrett esophagus are important risk factors for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Now, can anything reduce the risk of adenocarcinoma in the esophagus? And the answer is yes. As you can see, diets that are rich in fruits and vegetables can reduce the risk. And the second bullet point is also very interesting. Some strains of Helicobacter pylori can cause gastric atrophy. And whenever there is gastric atrophy, and this particularly happens following long-standing infection with Helicobacter pylori in the body and fundus of the stomach. So when there is gastric atrophy, there is also loss of gastric parietal cells. And recall that gastric parietal cells are responsible for production and secretion of hydrochloric acid. So when those cells are lost, there is decreased acid secretion and that reduces the risk of reflux. And since reflux was a risk factor, so whenever the reflux is reduced, the risk is also reduced. So that's why some strains of Helicobacter pylori can reduce the risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma. So now let's talk about the pathogenesis of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. How is this cancer developing? As we can see, progression occurs through stepwise acquisition of genetic and epigenetic changes. And always remember that this cancer is developing in multiple steps. For example, first there was Barrett esophagus, then there was dysplastic changes in those Barrett mucosa, then there was carcinoma in situ, and then adenocarcinoma developed. So multiple steps are involved, and in each step there is acquisition of new genetic and epigenetic changes. For example, at initial stage there may be chromosomal abnormalities and mutation in TP53, that is a tumor suppressor gene, and also mutation in CDK2A, that is another tumor suppressor gene, and it stands for cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor 2A. So, what will be the result of these mutations? Say, for example, if there is a mutation in TP53, what will be the result? To understand this, first we have to know what is the normal function of these tumor suppressor genes. For example, what is the normal function of TP53? Now, always remember, in a normal individual, when there is damage in DNA, the TP53 tumor suppressor gene will arrest the cell cycle or it will hold the cell cycle in a proliferating cell so that the cell can repair the damaged DNA. Because if a cell is proliferating with damaged DNA, there is high chance that the daughter cells may have mutation and may ultimately become a cancer cell. So that's why it is very important to repair damaged DNA. And in order to repair that, the TB53 tumor suppressor gene will hold the cell cycle and then it will allow time to 
repair those damaged DNA by various mechanisms. Now, if that damaged DNA is still unrepairable, what will TP53 do? It will induce programmed cell death or apoptosis, and in that case, the cell along with its damaged DNA will die. And that is in fact a good thing because if the cell that had a damaged DNA is getting killed or committing suicide, it means that the damaged DNA will no longer be transferred to the daughter cells and there will be no chance of mutation. So it is in a sense a programmed cell death to prevent mutation, to prevent cancer. So whenever there is mutation in TP53, these steps will not be possible. As a result, there will be high chance of mutation. And as we can see, progressively, there will be development of other problems. There will be amplification of EGFR, ERBB2, MET, cyclene D1, cyclene E, and all these things will have its effect and ultimately lead to development of adenocarcinoma. And as we can see in this bottom section, we can see the sequential evolution. So initially there was baritisophagus and we know that in baritisophagus the squamous epithelium in the lower part of the esophagus is getting replaced by intestinal type epithelium and that is not good and that is followed by dysplasia there will be pleomorphism variation in size and shape of the cells there will be large hyperchromatic nucleus and the nucleus and cytoplasmic ratio will become high due to the enlarged size of the nucleus and also there will be loss of orderly differentiation all these things will happen in dysplasia ultimately there will be carcinoma in c2 there will be full thickness atypia or full thickness dysplasia but this dysplasia has not yet penetrated the basement membrane so this stage is known as carcinoma in c2 and when there is penetration or invasion of the basement membrane that will lead to uh, adenocarcinoma as we will see so now let's talk about the morphology of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus as we can see typically it occurs in distal one third of the esophagus as shown with red color in this diagram and cardia of stomach may often become invaded so what is that cardia of stomach always remember the part of the stomach that is immediately after the esophagus that is known as cardia of the stomach that means where the esophagus ended and where the stomach began so this part this part is actually the cardia of stomach and since it is very close to the lower one third of the esophagus so it is often involved with the tumor of the esophagus now regarding the shape initially the tumor will have flat or raised patch appearance but then as the tumor is growing it may become a large fungating or nodular mass it may infiltrate diffusely in that case the wall will be thickened and it may ulcerate or invade into deeper tissues so all these things can happen and as shown in these images we can see for example this is the image of fungating or polypoid type of growth if the tumor is growing in such manner then it may obstruct the lumen of the esophagus sometimes it may even completely obstruct the lumen of the esophagus with such fungating or polypoid growth the second image was that of ulcerating type in this type of cancer there will be surface ulceration and the third image that i had drawn here is that of diffusely infiltrating growth pattern so all these things can happen now the last point is also very important i have written that such cancer may have adjacent barrett mucosa now what do we mean by this term barrett mucosa recall that the normal lining epithelium of the esophagus is squamous epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium and in Barrett esophagus that is getting replaced by intestinal type 
columnar epithelia. So even when we are looking at the esophagus or the stomach grossly, we can see that there will be different color. For example, the squamous mucosa usually has a pale color and the mucosa, the metaplastic mucosa that has a red velvety appearance and the lining epithelium of stomach is also columnar epithelium and that has light brown appearance. So this is the columnar mucosa of the stomach. This is the squamous mucosa of the esophagus and if there was barrett esophagus there would have been such red velvety tongue like region that are projecting or that are moving upwards along the esophagus and if there was a cancer here so we can see we will have both area of adenocarcinoma and we will have areas where there the mucosa will have barrett mucosa appearance so what will be the microscopic appearance of the tumor cells as we can see the tumor cells will usually produce mucin and they will also form glands and the glands will be intestinal type columnar epithelium and usually the tumor is well to moderately differentiated and they will have adjacent barrett mucosa often they have adjacent barrett mucosa and we have also talked about that in the previous section and rarely the tumor may be diffusely infiltrating and those types of tumors will also have signatory cell now on the left we can see an image this is showing intestinal type glandular epithelium so it is forming a gland and we can see that the nucleus are variable they are enlarged they are hyperchromatic and they have variable shape and size so this is not normal this is neoplastic epithelium and this is in fact adenocarcinoma intestinal type and it is usually seen in esophageal adenocarcinoma now regarding the signatory cells what do we mean by this now to understand this first we have to know what is a signatory now in the middle ages noble persons used to carry a ring in their finger and that ring was very bulky and they could use that ring as a seal in their official papers so from there we get the name signet ring and what is happening in diffusely infiltrating adenocarcinoma is due to excessive production of mucin the nucleus of the tumor cell is pushed at the periphery and that is giving an appearance of signet ring so this is an image of signet ring this is the nucleus and as we can see it is pushed to the periphery due to abundant mucin so this is known as signet ring cell and it is seen in diffusely infiltrating adenocarcinoma and that is rarely seen in the esophagus so now let's talk about the clinical features as we can see the onset is gradual or insidious initially there is dysphagia to solids what do we mean by dysphagia it means difficulty in swallowing and initially the patient will have difficulty in swallowing solid food particles but gradually the patient will develop dysphagia to all types of food particles not only solid but also to liquid food and since the patient is having difficulty in swallowing and also due to cancer there will be extreme weight loss the patient may also have hematemesis that is vomiting with blood the patient may also complain of chest pain and often this type of tumor spread early by submucosal lymphatic vessels regarding five-year survival it is 80 percent when the tumor is confined to the mucosa and submucosa but unfortunately if the tumor has spread along the lymphatic vessels of the submucosa then the five-year survival becomes 25 percent that's why early diagnosis is very important for this type of tumor so how can we diagnose esophageal adenocarcinoma when the clinician is suspecting a case of esophageal adenocarcinoma the clinician will advise a lot of laboratory tests for example one test is known as 
barium swallow here the patient first will swallow barium and then a series of x-rays will be taken and since the barium is coating the esophagus so when the patient had swallowed barium it will be easier to visually see certain tumors or abnormalities in the x-ray when certain abnormalities are noted the physician may also advise endoscopic biopsy here a flexible tube will be inserted along with camera and light and the tumor can be visualized with the help of this endoscopy and biopsy material or tissue material may be collected from the tumor and that will be sent to the histopathology lab for further diagnosis certain biomarkers are helpful and certain biomarkers can be used to detect certain genetic abnormalities and also to determine treatment options other options that will help will include ct scan mri pet ct scan etc so all these tests will help in diagnosing the cancer but always remember biopsy is the gold standard okay so histopathological report and biopsy is the gold standard and that will in fact confirm the diagnosis so what are the treatment options when the physician has diagnosed esophageal adenocarcinoma surgical resection is the primary treatment option and preoperative neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy are also used so this concludes our first part of esophageal tumor lecture in the second part we will continue our discussion and talk about squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus okay i hope this video was helpful if you like my videos do comment share and let me know and for my students i will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more okay that's all for today until next time take care and stay blessed thank you